stuck here. Yeah, so the new deadline is the 24th of March. That's two weeks later. Yeah. Are you guys going to be supporting the strike? You don't, I'm not saying you have to, I'm not pressing you. Are you going to be supporting the strike? My grandmom is coming, so I don't have her, so... You can't support the strike because your grandma is coming. Okay. Whatever. What about the other three? Are you supporting the strike? <laughs> I get that picture. <laughs> well, I was honest. <laughs> no, honesty is probably the best policy right here. This is all the other, all the readings left to the end of the course. So obviously you know that there won't be a seminar on Thursday, because that's the first day of the strike.
from um, sources. Yes. Um, since we haven't studied music as a form of media, yes. would it be completely irrelevant to use music as like a, as a supporting thing? Or would it because would it be irrelevant because we haven't studied it, or would it add value? It would always add value if you just follow every, you're talking about the assignment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you follow every all the um, guidance in the guidance notes. So don't talk about music instead of the guidance yeah, yeah. notes. In addition to it's in addition to it's correct. Okay, of course. And like radio is included with that. Or not really? Yeah, I mean it's probably easier that I answer this question in a slower fashion, i.e. by email, so like okay. I can think about what you're asking. Yeah, I think it might be better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically has everybody got a lecture outline for Hollywood? No? There's no mock exam for ICC media. You don't look so happy. It's not good for you. It's cancer? There's no mock exam. But I thought the mock exams were in the last week. Yeah. But there is, this is an email that I think you've been sent. Um, it's something to do with Birkbeck being on strike as well, like because, and, and yeah. Robokings. So there will be no mock exam in week 10. Instead of mock exams in the week 10, what I'm planning to do with you is, obviously this is the week after the strikes end, what I'm planning to do with you is to um, offer you individual second assignment tutorials pre-submission, because you know also, don't you, that the deadline for the second assignment submission has been moved back a month. Yeah? Uh, is it two it, weeks? It's, it's, oh, hang on, let me just check. So maybe I'm confused, confused with FTPS. Sorry, two weeks. It's, it, it's a month for FTPS. So yeah, from the 10th of March to the 24th of March. But that still gives us more time in week 10 mm -hmm. to do um, individual tutorials. So I'm not going to book. The, I'm not going to send out a, a, a sign up sign up sheet right now for that. Okay. Is the exam like an essay question? Sorry. Is the exam is like an essay. The exam, I will talk all about the exam later, not, not right now at the beginning of this lecture. Yeah? But it's, it's, it's basically divided into three sections. I think there's five questions per section, loosely speaking, each section. Section A is for term one, section B is for term two, and section C is for term three, which is just four lectures. But um, you'll, you'll get all the information you need. Um, for that uh, later in the course, yeah, as you normally do. Right. Obviously, Debbie and I regret quite sincerely the disruption that the strikes are going to cause you. It's a complex matter for all of us. And, um, yeah, so we, we will do our best to, to, to compensate for it, but part of the, I'm sure you appreciate, part of the reason for the strike is to cause disruption, so this is why we can't directly replace lost classes or lost lectures with new ones. We can't do that. But we don't certainly don't want to place you at a disadvantage with regard to the exams and the assessment system and your essay assessment. We'll be giving you as much help as we possibly can. Alright? So let's crack on with Hollywood. Let's just do the register.
Hamlet's not here, is she? Yeah. No. Well, yeah, I know it's the truth. We usually say no, she's not here, but I know what you mean. No, <laughs> she, yeah, she's not here. Why so early? And Salome is not here. Okay, we're going to start off. This is I'm packing a lot into one hour, even less than an hour now, and I've got several clips to share with you. So it's going to be a bit crazy. It's going to be a bit fast today, but um, you know, hopefully, it will make some kind of sense. So the first thing that I want to think about, or want you to think about, if you don't already know about it, is this this word genre, French word. Have you heard this word genre before? Yes. Okay, what's a genre? Type or kind. So we have television genres, it's the French word for type or kind, we have television genres and we have film genres. Hollywood is uh, Hollywood films are, can be divided into types of films or genres. For the purposes as, as audiences, we like particular kinds of films, particular genres, and most of us have a favourite genre. But for industrial reasons, for political economic reasons, um, Hollywood production companies like to use genres as well. It's a very good way of guaranteeing a certain level of income. And uh, popularity for films, which we'll come back later, come back to later. Um, let's just quickly mention a few genres. What kind of uh, genres can you think of in terms of Hollywood? Action, horror. Action. Thrillers. Thrillers. Psycho. Horror. Psycho. Did you say psycho? Psycho. Psycho. Yes. Psycho. Horror. Horror. Like psychological drama. I'm not aware of a psychological drama being, but arguably that, yes. No, I'm not saying maybe she meant psychological. Okay. Hor horror is not the same as psychological. Um, okay. Hmm. It seems so far, isn't it? Sci okay. No, let, me, let me give you the list and then we can argue about it later. Right? So, so action movies, drama, his history, epic, blockbuster, Romance, rom-com, romance and comedy. These are some of the conventional uh, genres, but clearly some of them do cross over. Okay. So the first point um, we need to think about is that all Hollywood genres have narrative and technical conventions. I'm going to start by way of an example, a very, very famous example um, of a film called Jaws. Um, which I believe came out around about 1979, I think, something like that. Um, what genre is Jaws? Horror. 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 Okay. So I'm going to play you the trailer for Jaws. Okay? And as you watch it, I want you to look at the following to think about the um, aesthetic conventions of the horror Hollywood genre. Think about... Lighting, music, colour, editing, that's, the, that's how each scene is cut together, how quickly you change <coughs> from one scene to the other. Think about emotion, this is really key, we're going to be talking quite a lot about emotion in Hollywood today. Yeah, so let's just watch um, this clip and think what makes a horror Hollywood uh, ho Sorry, a Hollywood horror genre, what makes it distinctive, what makes it different from other genres in terms of lighting, music, colour, editing, emotion. Did you have a question? Yeah, no. I was going to ask if thriller is in the same category as horror. Debatably, I mean a thriller is not necessarily horrific, is it? Yeah. A thriller is something that's got suspense. Okay. I think the key word there is suspense, but clearly there's always some crossover. Extraordinary motion picture version of P. 
Peter Benchley's best-selling novel, Jaws. I just found out that a girl got killed here last week. And you knew it. You knew there was a shark out there. You knew it was dangerous. But you can't swim anyway. Monsters, 
serial killers. These all are part of the net. The stories are often around these kinds of characters um, producing the narrative convention of horror. Yeah? But, and here's, here's a probably um, quite, quite an interesting point, well, I think it's an interesting point because this is, again, where, how we can compare um, horror with, say, news today. What are we afraid of in Jaws? What's, what's the, ob ob the bad object that makes sure. it? A shark. A shark as a monstrous, non-human animal. I would say, I'm sure I wouldn't be the only one, psychoanalytically, it's a fear of the sea, it's a fear of the environment. It's actually reinforcing the idea that the world is dangerous, in particular, that animals are dangerous. Yeah? And I would argue that psychoanalytically it's reinforcing an alienation with the environment. Because if you care to study the behavior of sharks, do they actually pre prey on humans normally? No, they don't. So this is, actually, in terms of analysis or, or psychoanalysis, this is where something like George is, is very interesting. Because really, <coughs> arguably, theoretically, it's about the human psyche. And there has, there's been some good um, theoretical writing about Jaws being about capitalism and how capitalism is destroying the environment. Yeah? Or you think, you know, the director of Jaws is Steven Spielberg, famous also for Jurassic Park, dinosaurs, playing the same psychic role of the big other, yeah, that's going to get us. Right? So, it's very interesting, and I've tried to mention this many times in the course, and I, I will continue to do so, and I'll come back to this at the end of today's lecture, the idea of the environment being other. You can't trust it. It's dangerous. It's not human. A monster. Yes, it's a monster in the form of a huge shark. Right? So, symbolically, it seems to represent something for human beings. Okay, so, let's go to... So, um, I've just used horror as one example of a film genre, but, but all genres I'm arguing and, and, and um, conventionally are argued in, in media textbooks have their own uh, narrative and technical conventions. Part of the reason, or one of the main reasons why genres um, are so successful is that they they fulfil our expectations. So as I as we, I mentioned already, we all tend to have a favourite film genre, and because we have a, because we have certain film genres that are popular. In fact, let's talk about this. What do you think is the most popular Hollywood film genre? Which one do you think it is? Action. It is action. Can you think why action movies should be more popular than other ones? It's visual stimulation. Yes, but so are, so are non-action movies, to a certain extent, but... It's, it's a bit of a power trip, kind of. It takes, yeah. gives the viewer, makes them feel what it feels like to be powerful without actually making them powerful, if that makes sense. Right, so it's back to this key word that we mentioned here before, I think, identification. Yeah? Because um, conventionally speaking, Hollywood films always have a, uh, an individual hero, and we are invited through the narrative conventions to identify with the hero, an individual hero. Yeah, men in particular. Yeah, it's also argued that um, working class men, less educated men, are more likely to identify with a figure like I don't know. Rocky or the Terminator or like or Hulk or men in general like Marvel men with big muscles because they are successful using their bodies. Yeah? And for people who are not educated, who, who don't benefit from their educational success, young men in particular, they can they can um, experience the fantasy on the screen of being powerful. Yeah? And that's 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 theoretically argued as well. From the industrial perspective, 
And the reason that jars are very popular is because uh, movie producers, Hollywood producers, know in advance which kinds of films are most likely to be successful in terms of box office. So they can, they can restrict, they can minimise their risks and they can guarantee a certain return on the investment. So if we think Marvel, for example, it's almost become a genre by itself, very, very popular genre, because so many young men, not just men, but mostly men, like Marvel. And so it doesn't matter if one Marvel film to you and I looks very, very similar. As far as the movie producer, Hollywood producers are concerned, there's a guaranteed number of people that are going to go and see that film that's going to generate profit for the for the commercial Hollywood company. So, it's, so genre has advantages from both sides of the fence, from production, from the production end, but also the audience end, for our expectations. Sometimes our expectations is, oh, I love a particular actor, I love a particular director. So you'll go and see a film that always has a certain actor in it. That's also a way of guaranteeing um, expectation. So they minimize risks. And also, um, <coughs> the second point here, um, genres from an industrial perspective, they facilitate planning and efficiency. That basically means that um, the same genre often uses the same sets and scenery and locations. So it makes it efficient from, from an economic perspective that way. You can put um, the same actors and you, you're repeating, you, you're saving money by, by not always having to um, yeah, you can just basically use the same equipment again and again for particular genres. Um, I'm going to try to illustrate um, today one of the main features of Hollywood. You, by, by way of a, a comparison, um, Debbie is very, very familiar with this, so forgive me for just doing this a year and year out. I actually feel a certain amount of guilt putting through this every day. <laughs> um, how many of you guys have seen either of these films? Or both? Can you see? <laughs> this one, Man on Wire, is actually a documentary. Okay, made in 2008. It's about a real person, French man called Philippe Petit, who was 24, who in 1974 he did a tightrope walk from one of the World Trade Center towers to the other. And of course, he did it very illegally, but he actually managed to do it in real life. This is a documentary about how he did it. Okay, then a few years later, in particular, uh, seven years later, with The Walk, Hollywood thought, oh, there's an individual historical hero that we could make into a Hollywood kind of action style narrative. They changed the name to The Walk, okay? So I'm gonna show you clips <coughs> from both because next week's lecture is gonna be on documentary. So that you could, and I think one of the best ways to bring out what's unique and distinctive about Hollywood is to compare a documentary version of history with a Hollywood version of history. And it's very interesting. It's not necessarily what you might expect. Um, before we watch the first clip, in fact, let's, let's put the first clip on there, actually. I'm sure, um, secretly, I have some kind of association with uh, Philip Petit. In my mind, he, he kind of, there's something quite exciting about it, this guy and what, what he did in his life. I think it's quite amazing. So I have a personal bias.
So as I show you um, a few minutes of a, a, a clip, or one or two clips, from Man and Wife, this is the documentary version of Philippe Petit's um, special uh, achievement. I want you to think what particular, in terms of uh, documentary convention, is it doing? How, what's the narrative? Uh, can, can you spot some technical conventions in this documentary representation? Can you spot some narrative conventions before we look at the Hollywood? representation. How is it telling the story? Yeah? What makes documentary unique as a genre? Right? Okay, so let's just watch that. First of all, interview. Yeah? Voice over, interview. These are what we associate with documentary convention. Yeah? Notice that the music, I would argue, I think you'll probably agree, is still quite Hollywood, creating kind of quite evocative emotional music. So documentary does borrow some feature film Hollywood techniques as well. This is obviously not the real event. This is what we call a reconstruction. Yeah? So it's a historical re reconstruction, and it uses particular techniques. One of them is archive material, old, real audio-visual material. Yeah? Um, let's see if we can find an example of that. Bonsoir. Philippe Petit, Philippe So what we've seen so far is clearly all a reconstruction of history. So in many ways, it's still a construction. I mean, a documentary is supposed to be about truth, isn't it? It's supposed to be about the real thing. So despite the fact that it's documentary, it's creating truth. But it's not doing it in the same way as Hollywood, and that's what I want you to, to recognize. So far, we haven't got the hero. We haven't seen... Billy Petit is coming on. I was going to be on the crew of the South Carolina. We were going to go at closing time. It was suddenly not a dream anymore. That's Billy Petit, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the real person in the narrative. That gives it authenticity truth. Not necessarily objectivity, but certainly truth. The real person. In his words, through his mind, in his memory. He's more authentic than an actor that we're going to see playing his role, playing him in the Hollywood version. Right? It was tangible. Il ne pas continuer à vivre sans avoir essayé au moins de de posséder ces tours-là, parce que ces tours étaient devenues à lui. C'était comme si elles avaient été construites pour lui, d'ailleurs. That's what we call realia, you know. This is his real employee and identification card, yeah? It gives it the ring of truth, the convention of truth, constructing truth, documenting truth. Real footage here of the World Trade Center towers being constructed. Historical footage, right? Shaky camera gives it a sense of reality, authenticity. Hollywood tends not to have shaky camera. Now this, I believe, is early footage of him practicing being a tightrope walker. So again, it's also got the personal, the real art, personal archive. Yeah? All of these are elements um, peculiar to documentary film, generally not particular to Hollywood film, and the version I'm going to show you in a moment. So let's just get back to the lecture notes. 
Now, I'm going to argue, and I invite all of you, each of you, to disagree or to test my theory, it's not just my theory, that the narrative structure of mainstream Hollywood film is very boringly familiar and predictable. You can, how many times have you watched a Hollywood film and you've been in the middle of the narrative and you kind of think, I know exactly what's going to happen, right? That's how controlled a Hollywood narrative is, yeah? The standard, the real sort of boiled down, very simple reductionist theory about a Hollywood film is, is as follows. All Hollywood narratives start with equilibrium. So this is what we call order or stability. So we could say, I'd like to say, that in this class now, it's just normal, right? It's an everyday, normal, ordinary scene. Then, something has to disturb the equilibrium. And if we're talking about horror, because we're using that as a working example, you know, um, uh, maybe the Joker, I will put on a mask and turn into the Joker, yeah? <laughs> or the Joker will burst through the door, you know? And that will disturb the equilibrium, right? Um, then, the, the end of the narrative has to be resolved by, again, if we continue with horror as the example, the source of evil, the intrusion, has to be killed, has to be wiped out. Ha order has to be restored. So. It's argued that all Hollywood narratives conform to this basic structure. Equilibrium, normal everyday life, something goes wrong, there's a problem, it has to be solved, it's solved at the end. When the problem is solved at the end, that's called closure. Yeah? And it's, the idea is, from an from a, um, emotional, psychological perspective, um, audiences like the closure of Hollywood films because they always end well. You know, so the hero hero triumphs, and the bad guy is 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 killed, or the evil is eradicated. <coughs> now, if, if if we if you believe that, if you accept that that argument, can you think of anything um, ideological about the fact that the the good guy always wins and the bad guy is killed? Does that reflect real life? Look at the world today. No. Okay. Why would Hollywood want to promote a model that doesn't conform to real life? Why? So it could induce a fantasy. Yes, but from a political perspective? They can promote themselves as a justice good It's creating the fantasy, and don't underestimate, don't think fantasy is not important, it's creating the fantasy that whenever anything goes wrong politically, it can be solved through the American, through, in, in certainly an American cultural context. It's promoting the idea of the individual, and it's not asking any of the important documentary current affairs questions about what is wrong politically. It's also ideologically supporting a system of capitalism. Yeah? That capitalism is not the problem. Yeah? And often, even when there is an economic problem about hard, you know, uh, economic hardship or poverty in a narrative, it will often, the story will be told in such a way that the person who is poor is poor because it's their, his or her fault. There's no social uh, rationale. This is where Joker challenges the Hollywood convention because it, it's actually about the social. Right? But conventionally speaking, Hollywood narratives are all about promoting the individual and the American dream, the ideology of the American dream, which is that any individual in America can be a success, an economic success, just by virtue of working hard and they will be rewarded. Not taking into account racial inequality, economic inequality, and so on and so forth. So clearly there's a strong ideological link between Hollywood narratives here and capitalism, neoliberalism, consumerism, and advertising. Yeah? And that's obviously something I'd like to think about. Um, it's very important that narratives, Hollywood narratives, should be realist believable. We know that they're not true, but what I'm going to show you when I show you the Hollywood clip of Philip Petit uh, in a moment is that even though you know this is a Hollywood clip, 
physically, when you look at the, the images, it's going to have an effect on your bodies and your minds. The fantasy is very powerful. Even though you know it's not true, even though you're suspending your disbelief, unconsciously you are believing in some ways. And this is where ideology always works. We always think that we're really rational, we know it's rubbish, and we know it's politically rubbish, but actually it does have an effect on us. Um, Hollywood narratives tend to have a clear cause and effect relationship between elements. They're very, very, everything's very simple, there's no complexity. Real life is very, very complex. And, and narrative closure, there's always an end point. Things end, you know. Uh, again, real life is, is somewhat different. So I've mentioned uh, nar um, narrative and ideology. Uh, just to sort of go over some of the points with regard to ideology, America is a melting pot a land comprised of immigrants who can achieve success irrespective of the circumstances of their birth. Right? This is part of the American uh, dream ideology. Um, Hollywood narratives focus on individual achievement. No barriers to success except through the lack of individual qualities. Competition is often promoted in Hollywood narratives over cooperation. Individual over society, competition, conflict over cooperation. Yeah. Um, so the ideology of the American dream focuses on individuals overcoming obstacles to success. Real life economic, political inequalities are largely off screen, they're invisible. We are always focusing on individual psychological qualities, yeah? Which is neoliberal. Right? The individual, the construction of the individual. You know, the idea that the individual is the most important so political actor in society. That's a neoliberal idea. That's the idea that comes through through consumer capitalism. And of course, as I've already mentioned, the idea of narrative closure that problems can always be resolved. Whatever goes wrong in a Hollywood fantasy, in a Hollywood narrative, it will be resolved. Yeah? Nothing to fear, you know? So, let's look at the Hollywood version, uh, The Walk, and see if we think of that. <laughs> Any questions so far? Anything that I said that's not clear, that I said that I rushed, or do you want a question? You sure? I'll just play you the beginning of the walk and I'll play the end and you'll, you'll see the difference. Sorry, technically not very strong at the moment. English. Does he get paid? Does he get paid? Yeah. What do you mean? Does the, the actual man, the French man, who actually did it, get paid? Like, who, who would pay him? He was breaking the American law. Okay. It was criminal activity. Okay. Which is ironic when you realise that Hollywood is now celebrating when he's yeah. here. We've got some work yeah. to do. I guess he got paid in personal glory. And 
yeah. and inc incredible bravery. You'll see what I mean. Yeah. But does he get paid from like the money? Oh, you mean royalties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I beg your pardon. I have no idea. What did you think I meant? Um, for, for doing oh, for doing it? Yeah. No, 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 I meant like like a commission. Not a commission. I imagine he does, but I have no idea, really. Because like, could he sue them if he, they didn't pay them? That's a really interesting question. I'm sure if you Google it, you could probably find out. Yeah. Yeah. So interestingly, it's, it's not dissimilar in some ways, it's still a reconstruction of, it, of his personal life and what happened as a child. But you could all, it's got a different feel, it's got that Hollywood high production values feel, it's not, it, you can feel the money and the, you know, the special effects and so on. But more importantly is the end, and when, when I show you the end and, and, and the images that I'm about to show you, I want you to think about, you've seen the documentary which is supposed to be about the real life historical event, and now you're seeing the Hollywood construction of the historical event, I want you to ask yourselves the question, which one looks and feels more real, right? Documentary is supposed to be more real, right? It's really happened. The hot Hollywood is, is the fantasy factory, it's the dream factory, it can make anything look real. So just look at the images of him doing his tightrope walk in a moment and think to yourself, which one feels and looks more real?
Okay, do we have the line? So, my question was, um, the documentary clip that you saw, Man on Wire, compared with the Hollywood version of the war, which one looks and feels more real? Just that the second one. Why? Because uh, good use of lighting has been used, and, plus, and second of all, uh, the actor has actually uh, <coughs> play, uh, sorry, uh, the actor has actually like, uh, played uh, the character like he is the character, and in terms like, um, and in terms like this is how we imagine um, like the way he, uh, the way the man has actually like, crossed the world. Yeah, um, I think it's because it gets us more involved and it allows us to identify. How does it get us more involved? Because it uh, lets us identify with the man. Exactly. And it keeps us with him, which makes us able to relate to it. Yes. We get inside his character, but also it looks real. When the camera pans down and you can see the ground underneath it, it really gives you a sense. Imagine also in the cinema on a big screen. My God, that's exactly what it was like. There's no documentary footage of that if the real event happened in 1974, right? So, it arguably, the second Hollywood version is more powerful, and this is how Hollywood can reconstruct history politically. Because it can re reconstruct political events, make them look real, change the politics, make America look better than it usually is, and therefore, it's an ideological manipulation. And so I think this, this kind of illustrates very powerfully the ideological manipulation, just of a simple historical event, and how, you know, and knowing, knowing that it, it really happened, if you watch the whole of the documentary of Man and Wire, the whole of the war, and you think you understand what happened historically, you'll, you'll remember the Hollywood version more than the documentary version, yeah? So th there's, some, there's a problem with documentary, isn't there? You know, how do you make it, maybe real life is, is boring, and, and, and so how do you show truth? How do you construct truth? This is, this is a big problem. You were going to say something else? I want to ask a question uh, regarding your comment about, well, your statement that basically Hollywood movies can change, change, put their version of history and manipulate it and so on. What's your opinion on the movie American Sniper? <laughs> I have not seen it. You have not seen it? Have you heard of it? I've heard of it. Okay. Tell us briefly about it. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember it 100%, so I don't know if I'm saying like spoilers or anything, but basically it's about um, a, a unit of soldiers in Iraq who get um, surrounded and pinned down in a building, and how one man basically defended most of his, um, so like most of the soldiers under him, and how he combated with another sniper who was taking out a lot of the people from his, with, with him, that were in his unit. Um, and it talks about, and it basically talks about him being a hero, but then it also shows him as, like it shows the effects of PTSD on him and how mm -hmm. after coming back it's really, really bad and the only way he can feel good again is by going back to war and so it's a, it's, it's a bit weird because it's a bit propaganda -y, but it also kind of it shows a little bit the effects war can have. I mean, as usual, you're making a brilliant point, and we're talking about a particular genre of Hollywood, which is war films. War film is a genre, yeah. but if you if you if you take the same kind of critical perspective to Hollywood war films, yes, they're always about promoting the Western American political involvement in the narrative as being heroic, in the same way that the newspapers have that, you know, commercial newspapers have that ideological bias, and you know, if you take films about Vietnam, like The Deer Hunter, um, 1978, Michael Cimino. It's, it's got some amazing Hollywood actors like Robert De Niro, Christopher Walken, and Meryl Streep, beautifully filmed, very well acted. But look at how the Vietnamese uh, soldiers are portrayed. They're like animals, they're cruel, they're vicious. Yeah, This is propaganda. This is how quickly that manipulation can change people's minds and become racist. Um, you know, so yeah, absolutely. There was um, a Vietnam movie, I'm just trying to find its name. It was very, I think it was Full Metal Jacket. It's about oh, German. Yeah, Full Metal Jacket. Stan, Stan yeah. Kubrick. Mm -hmm. So what, what's, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's brilliant. I love all his films. Um, I don't think the 
think he has a different approach towards Western. Uh, well, he's a he's, uh, a, he's a very unusual uh, Hollywood film director who managed to achieve huge success within Hollywood, but his films are really clever and thoughtful. And yeah, because I think he portrays the West as the villain. Yeah, most so that, of the time. And, and Hollywood let him in. Yeah, yeah. but but there's always exceptions that prove the rule. If you like, we'll talk more. In, oh, will we talk more in the seminar? Not this thing. We'll talk later, whenever that will be. All right. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. If you have time, I recommend you watch um, a movie. It might still be on. I don't know if it's still on Netflix, but it was on Netflix. It's called uh, Restrepo. Yes. 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 I, I remember. No, I heard it. It's basically about um, a camp of Americans yeah. in Afghanistan yeah. and their experiences during the war. And it doesn't romanticize any of it. It's very real. It's a very good example. Yeah. Yeah. So and I really enjoyed it. It's a bit scary, but I, I really enjoyed it, even though it's like very obviously biased. I might try and look at it before next week for the documentary lecture. It might change something. I'll try and send that in like a few. Uh, do you know what? I think I've got it on a, a DVD, right? Because I got it on the internet. Yeah, but I never watched it. It was part of my PhD research, but I never got around to watching it. I'll send, can I send you a few, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course you can. Thank you. My phone was fine. Thank you. 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 Phone? Yeah. And your umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's all right.